I did not grow up going to Holy Week services. I was raised Presbyterian, so when I was a child, my family went to church on Palm Sunday, and then we went to church on Easter Sunday, and both seemed to me like pretty joyful occasions. I knew that we were celebrating Jesus because he died for us on a cross and rose again, but the details were a little fuzzy. Then I became an Episcopalian and discovered Holy Week. And I have such clear memories of those first services I attended. Monday, Thursday, around a big dinner table in a parish hall, and the priest getting down on his knees to wash the feet of each of us at the table. And a three-hour Good Friday service with achingly gorgeous music and a sermon on each of Jesus' seven last words. And an Easter vigil that began at 10 p.m. in the pitch dark, and when the clock struck midnight, bells and bright lights and alleluias filled the sanctuary as we celebrated the first Eucharist of Easter. Suffice it to say, I was hooked on Holy Week. And now, as a priest, I try each year to get others hooked on Holy Week as well. There is, I believe and know from experience, a power in the pattern of these three liturgies to bring forth hope and make meaning of suffering. So it's my job as your priest and rector to keep banging the Holy Week drum, as it were, encouraging more and more of you to take part in these services and to be changed by them. But that's easier said than done, and it's not hard to see why. First of all, public schools regularly schedule spring break during Holy Week, so many families in churches like ours are away. And those who are in town are not in the habit of going to church during the week. Then there is the subject matter of Jesus' last days on earth, which can sound pretty depressing. So it's not surprising that many Episcopalians each year experience the Holy Week of my childhood and skip straight from Palm Sunday to Easter. The church figured this out and came up with a plan. Palm slash Passion Sunday. And many of you know this service well. First, we gather somewhere outside the church, we bless the palms, and we shout, Hosanna, and then we march in procession, singing all glory, laud, and honor. And then, almost immediately, the tenor of worship takes a sharp turn, and we leave the palms behind to perform a reading or a dramatic presentation of the entirety of our Lord's passion, his betrayal, denial, humiliation, suffering, and death. So parishioners go from shouting, Hosanna, to shouting, crucify him in under 10 minutes, which is jarring, to be sure. But it is the church's way of giving a preview of Holy Week to communicate the reality that Easter joy makes no sense unless we've experienced something of the horror of Good Friday. But the Palm Passion Sunday is no match for the real thing. The narratives of Jesus' last days on earth are so dense and they are so ancient and mysteriously bound up both by salvation and suffering. The events of Holy Week demand more than a simple retelling. They come alive for us in the way these unique liturgies layer word and gesture and image and sign and sound. To put it bluntly, for this one week, the church expects her people to be more fully present to the truth of their lives than at any other time during the year and to bring our whole selves to the scope of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Not out of some kind of pious finger wagging, but from the conviction that God is bound and determined to change us, 
transform us. And so for these three days, we play our parts as willing actors in God's drama, giving ourselves over to the structure of language, and tradition, and song, and story as never before. So here we are, as Holy Week begins, the church has a captive audience, no vacations, no excuses, and in an ironic twist, we cannot be together. We cannot truly experience these dramatic and moving Holy Week liturgies because they are designed for our full participation, body, mind, and spirit, and not for observation from a distance. What then are we going to do? Well, we are not going to pretend that this is anything other than what it is, namely a Holy Week not of our choosing, during which we let go of some of what we love most about this sacred time in favor of deepening our understanding as best we can. So we will not hear the crucifixion story today, and we won't try to recreate our Holy Week services without our choir and organ and readers and congregation, and we won't celebrate Holy Eucharist when our people cannot share it. Instead, we will move day by day through the last week of Jesus' life on earth and lift up for you the primary signs and symbols of these triduum liturgies. And triduum is just a fancy churchy Latin word that means just, it just means three days. So for these three holy days of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, we will create brief expressions of worship that will be familiar to those who look forward to these services each year, and also an introduction for those of you who aren't hooked on Holy Week yet. My prayer is that in 2021, we will gather as a much wider community to live into this piece of our Christian identity as never before. So, here is a preview. On Monday, Thursday, in word and music, we will join the company of disciples at the Last Supper for the events leading up to Jesus' betrayal and arrest. We will hear of the new commandment that gives Monday Thursday its name, as well as the strange ritual act of foot washing, which asks us to imitate Jesus as a servant leader. We will remember and honor the institution of the Last Supper, even though we cannot celebrate it together. And then we will watch as our altar is stripped of all ornament and illumination to express the absence of Jesus from our midst. On Good Friday, we will gather at noon to listen to the account of Jesus' crucifixion from the Gospel of John with its rich beauty and sacrificial imagery. We will pray for the entire world, remembering that God sent his Son not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We'll claim our place as Jesus' hands and feet and heart and mind in our world today, as the church affirms its mission of redemption. And then we will face the definitive symbol of Jesus' servant ministry, the cross. In an act we call the veneration, we simply honor the cross, not as the instrument of Jesus' death, but as the pattern of Jesus' life of self-giving love. And in so doing, we meet the profound mystery of our faith, which is that God chooses to be present at the very place we most fear and dread. Finally, on Holy Saturday, we will be together for the great vigil of Easter, which is the most dramatic and complex service of the church year. The vigil is actually four discrete rituals. There's the lighting of the new fire, which signals Jesus' resurrection. 
There's the readings of our salvation history from the Old Testament. There's holy baptism, which recollects the church's ancient practices linking water stories with God's liberating action. And finally, in an ordinary year, we would celebrate the first Eucharist of Easter. So our vigil this year will stop just short of Easter. It will conclude with a great Alleluia in anticipation of returning together for Easter Sunday morning. And we are bound to hear new messages and discover new meanings for our lives by taking part in Holy Week this year as a community as best we can. And we will bring you each service <laughs> conscious that we cannot know what Easter Sunday is going to look like or feel like in just a week. A week can seem like a year right now and we don't know what's going to be asked of us over the next seven days as children of God, as followers of Jesus. So let us take a breath and return now to this moment, to Palm Sunday. In the life cycle of the church, the wheels of our Lord's suffering are already in motion. And so on Palm Sunday, we cry, Hosanna, in hope and trust that God will again make something out of nothing, that God will bring forth life out of death, that God will take what is and make it new. But even if we are silent on this day, the very stones around us built into this house of prayer will shout God's grief and God's glory. Hallelujah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs>